Good afternoon, my dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to our afternoon edition of Sunday School. We are so thankful that you have joined us. Uh, we want to say a word of prayer before we begin, so let us bow. Father in heaven, eternal God, we petition the throne of grace and mercy. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we come boldly as the Bible has said that we might. Father, asking for your forgiveness, asking that you would bestow your righteousness upon us, that you would help us be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. Now, Father, we ask you to prick the ears of the hearer that something might be said, something might be done that would uh, bring new life to them, help them to see their salvation afresh. And then for that person who might not know Jesus and the pardon of their sins, they might come running asking what they might do to be saved. Father, we thank you in advance for all that will transpire, all our eyes will see, and all our ears will hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 49 of Isaiah is where we are in our text today. We will be reading verses 18 through 23. The lesson today is called God's people shall prosper. God's people shall prosper. Let us read. Lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather together. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall surely put on all of them as jewels and bind them on as a bride. For your waste and desolate places and your destroyed land, surely now you will, will be too cramped for the inhabitants, and those who swallowed you will be far away. The children of whom you were bereaved will yet say in your ears, this place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may live here. Then you will say in your heart, who has begotten these for me, since I have been bereaved of my children, and I am barren, an exile, and a wanderer? And who has reared these? Behold, I was left alone. From where did these come? Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations, and set up my standard to the peoples. And they will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Kings will be your guardians, and they, their princesses your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet. And you will know that I am the Lord, those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. The word of God for the people of God. I have read verses 18 through 23 to you from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, today's lesson has what they call a high degree of difficulty. Uh, if you're familiar with the Olympics and the diving, uh, the higher the degree of difficulty, the greater amount of points one might get. And this is kind of that way to get a lot out of it uh, you have to understand what the difficulty is. And because it's such a high difficulty, of, uh, uh, I've chosen to read to you from the New American Standard, which is uh, a uh, more current use of the English uh, language so that we might hear from the words that we would actually use ourselves. So let us begin with the a little bit of what we call lesson context to kind of know where we are here in the text. Um, Jeremiah, remember, is predicting these things that would happen far and away from the time period that he lives. Uh, in our first lesson, Jeremiah predicted that Babylon would be conquered. And we know from history that the events that happened uh, as the Persians took over the land of the Babylon, Babylonians overnight, and Babylon was laid waste. We know these predictions uh, came true. 
And one of the things that makes this lesson so difficult is, is that when Isaiah is talking, we have to recognize if he's talking past, present, or future. Because in many cases, these predictions of Isaiah's have a near and a far fulfillment. And we have to be able to see and recognize which is which, which makes it quite difficult. And, but we are able to understand from the text that Isaiah is talking about something that's going to happen in the near future. And he's also talking about something that's going to happen in the far future. So, so the, the double entendre here is that God is a God of present but he is also a God of future. And, and we have much to be glad about that we serve a God who knows in advance our future, who has already paved the way for us and our protection in the future. And so we know that Cyrus and Darius and all of those, the Persians, the Medes, conquered the Babylonians. They did. But we also know that it was the edict of the Medes and the Persians that allowed the Israelites to go back into Jerusalem or into Judah, even the land of Israel, because it had been laid waste by the Babylonians. So now they are free people. They're free to go back to their homeland. And not only are they free to go back to their homeland, it's Going to be, the expense that it would take to go back to their homeland is going to be absorbed by the Medes and the Persians. So God is so great that not only is he sending his people back into Israel, he's paving the way through a group of Gentiles who will financially make that possible. So, so, so God says, not only will you let my people go, but you in turn will finance their return. Uh, th that's how great our God is. Is, is. He just doesn't say, you're free to go. I, I hope it works out well for you. He paves the way for us in advance. And there are so many uh, applications we can make today from what's happening in the text today and what happens in our real life. You know, uh, God clearly wants his people to prosper. And, and when I say prosper, I don't want you to confuse uh, this, this new narrative of what prosper means. Prosper in this narrative does not mean to be rich in money or gold or jewels. It means to be rich in Jesus Christ. It, it, it means to have those things. That, that spiritual connection, that spiritual communion with God that's valued higher than gold and rubies. So, so, so God wants us to prosper spiritually. Prospering spiritually also allows us, if we put spiritual first, it also allows us to prosper physically as well. But, but the idea here is that the edict is to let his people go, and the sad thing about what happened after the edict was issued was not many people went home. God had welcomed them back to Judah, to their homeland. The homeland had been taken from them by the Babylonians and some 70 years prior. And when they were allowed to go home, it says less than 50,000 of them went back home. Millions of them went into ca captivity, but only 50,000 came back on that first wave. So, so, so God wants us to prosper. He does. And he paves a way so that we might prosper. But you have to believe and trust in God in order to receive the blessings from God. God is, was sending a blessing from the Persian Empire to his people, the Jews, that they could go back to the homeland. As decimated as it was, as barren as it was, it was theirs. 
You know, you don't have to have a big house. You don't. You don't have to have the best TV. You, you, don't, you don't have to have the best furniture. You don't have to have any of those creature comforts. But if it's yours, it's yours. And, and, and it doesn't matter what it is or what other people think about it. It's yours. And, 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 and by some standards, what you have may be barren, may be desolate, or whatever that looks like to other people. But if it's yours, and particularly if it's paid for, it's yours. And no one can take that from you. And, and we have to believe that the blessings of God are not always numerical, they're not always financial, but that he cares for us and that he will make sure that we have those things which we find in necessity. And here he has given them the right to return to their homeland, and many of them have rejected him. So we'll start with verse 18. Lift up your eyes and look around. All of them gather together. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall surely put all of them on as jewels and bind them as with the bride. Now, the question here is who is them, they, and you? That, that, that's the real question in all of the text today is who are these people? So God says all of them gather together. Those are the exiles. And, and, and they come to you. You, you is Zion. You is Jerusalem. Uh, um, God is allowing his people to come back to their homeland. And, 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 and the issue is God is gathering them together. And in what we call this great reversal of fortune, uh, you know, what happens sometimes is that not everything that starts off good ends that way. You know that. By the same token, not everything that starts off badly ends that way. But in the upside-down kingdom of God, it is said that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The God of heaven will reverse the fortune of, of his people and the Jews will triumph over their enemies. You know, it, it's about eventual. It, it's not always about right now. You know, Isaiah's theme has always been, wait on the Lord. And we read this every week from Isaiah 40. But here in Isaiah 49, he says virtually the same thing. That, that, that those who wait on the Lord shall not be put to shame, is what he says. Now, so you have... If you, here, here's the thing. I don't know how many of you have been to a Jewish wedding. Jewish weddings are magnificent. They are incredible. Uh, they are lengthy. And, and they are a very joyous occasion. So God promises, as I live, you shall surely put on all of them as jewels and bind them as a bride. And, and, and so God is saying that in Zion... The people shall return, and they shall make a great nation. You know, uh, before they were entrenched in idolatry, Israel was a nation. It was a hated nation. You know that. Uh, it, it was a very small, Israel is a very small nation. It's surrounded by many hostile nations. And, and but, but when the people came back, he said that Zion would accept them as if they were jewels uh, around the neck and in the earlobes of a bride. That's the excitement. That, that, that's the um, flair with which these Jews might have in their own homeland. You know, it's, it's difficult to explain how precious home is. You know, as much as we like to go away and vacation and, and see our relatives and those things, the greater 
joy is always returning home because home is where the heart is. And God wanted these Jews in this near fulfillment that when they were allowed to go home from uh, the Medes and the Persians, that they would go back to what God calls a waste and desolate place. He said, I want you to go back to your destroyed land. You know, so here's the, the, the object now. Is, is so now they're wearing uh, jewels. The land will be wearing jewels of its people. It'll be ornated or ornamented with peoples. And, and the people will be the joy of the land. And, and, and they will rebuild Jerusalem and all of these things. And now he says, I want you to go back to this desolate place this place where there are no people. But one day, this land that has no people will be so full of people that you'll say, why is it so crowded? It'll be overflown with pe over, it will overflow with, pe with people. And it's interesting that this clearly cannot be a near fulfillment because we know that only a few of the exiles went back. So, 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 so it has to be a near fulfillment and not a far one because not a lot of people went back. But God says that one day it'll be too cramped for the inhabitants. And, and the interesting thing is I, I, I don't think we realize even as small a nation as Israel is how many Jews there are in the world. And I think in the millennial kingdom, when Israel is gathered back together, if you just knew how many Jews lived in Europe, and if you just knew how many Jews lived in Russia, and how many Jews lived in America, and how many Jews lived around the world, lived in this place other than Israel, you would understand that in a far fulfillment, when God regathers the nation, there will be so many people that the land can't hold them. And, and that's what the far fulfillment is, is God is saying to this people, go back home. Go back where you belong. Go back where you started. Go back to the place where you can worship me in spirit and in truth. Go back to that place where a blessedness, and, and may, may it look bad now, but I guarantee you as I live one day, it will be so full of people that you'll say, where did all of these come from? He says, and the people who swallowed you up, yeah, they'll be far away. The Babylonians lost control. As, as every nation who has believed itself to be the conqueror, they've all fallen away because no one controls the world except God and his son, Jesus Christ. And nations come and nations go. They swallow, but eventually they will be swallowed. And the interesting thing is in verse 20, it says, the children of whom you were bereaved will yet say in their ears, this place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I might live here. You know, when they got to Babylon, uh, many of them died on the way. Because you got to realize that, that, that uh, their homeland had been burned. Many of them were killed. Their women had been ravished. And, and, and they were walking as prisoners to their new home, which would be, would be Babylon. So many of them did not make it. So many of those who were on the journey from Jerusalem to Babylon didn't make it. Those are the bereaved children. And, and even when they got to Babylon, they were not obviously near the numerical uh, existence that they were when they were actually in the land. So. so they are a great nation, they are a reduced nation, and then when they come back into the land, they're a very small 
nation. If you read the book of Ezra, and we were studying Ezra a couple of months ago, and Ezra tells you about all of the, the sec, first, second, and third return, uh, the waves with which the Israelites came back into Jerusalem, you know that uh, they were not able or would not have been able to produce or have the kind of fertility that they could fill the land so much so that they would be cramped on the earth, even in Jesus' day that surely the numbers had grown much higher in all of the land of Israel, but not to the extent that God talks about when he talks about um, these being regathered on the earth. So, so you have a disorientation, really, in verse 21. You, you've got a widow who is bereaved of her children. And there is no possibility that she could repopulate Israel in its current state. But we serve a God, we serve a great God who can do all things more even than we can ask or even think. And in his ultimate plan, his plan is to give Israel the land. You know, those of us who are Christians, we recognize that our home will be heaven. But Israel has always been promised the land. That's why they call it the new heavens and the new earth. Because Israel will retain rights to the new earth. And it will be a supernatural gift of God with which a great increase will come out of nowhere. And it will look like or seem like it is a uh, fabulous, momentous occurrence when in truth God is just going to gather all of his people who are already there. They're just not in their homeland. But one day they will inherit the earth. It shall be their, theirs as the promise of God is. God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I will make your descendants like the stars of the sky, the sands of the earth. And one day you will inhabit the land. God's going to keep that promise. God's gonna, in, in the far fulfillment, God's going to keep that promise. And, and we need to make sure we understand that, that God is a God who keeps his promises. And, and, and for us, you know, even here yet on earth, as we battle life day by day, and many of us wonder, where is God? When all of these things are happening, we wonder to ourselves, where is God? And when we're at the gas pump, and we only have a few dollars, and you know that won't hold anymore. And when we're at home and the refrigerator is, is, is near emptiness, and that won't hold anymore, we wonder to ourselves, where is God? But God is a God who will always rescue his people, will always make sure that we have enough. If we just trust God, our issue is we have not trusted God as we should. So for us, if we would just trust God and recognize his sovereignty and understand that he will make sure we prosper, whatever that looks like, in his plan for our lives. We are not comparative people. We don't look at other people and say, well, here's what they have, why don't I have that? Maybe that's not God's plan for you. And, and, and we have to be careful that we live the life that God has given us to live and not attempt to live the life that he's given someone else to live. That, that we are his workmanship, we are his people, and, and that we are excited about his promises and we know that he will bring them all to fruition. Then he says, and who has reared these? This is in verse 21. And who has reared these? Behold, I was left alone. From whence did these come? And what he's speaking of is Zion wonders, the land wonders where all these people came from. Because there is no physical possibility of fertility. 
And what we think is barren, God is able to feel. God is able to make full those things which we believe are barren. You know, the great increase in the population of Zion is the future will be due to the Jews from all over the world streaming their way to Canaan. Not just because those living in Zion can produce many children. We, we know it's not possible. They, they can't do it. Only God can do it. Verse 22, very difficult verse, um, says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosom. And your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. You know, as we read that, once again, we need to know who's who. And, and, and clearly, God is speaking to the nation Israel, Zion. But he's talking to them about what he will do to the Gentile nations. How he will fly his flag high. And how he will... Allow this people, these people, the Gentiles, who were always, always in contradiction to the Jews. The Gentiles and the Jews never got along. Even in Jesus' day, you know, they say, what do Samaritans have to do with Jews? And Samaritans are half Jewish. If they couldn't get along with their cousins, surely they can't get along with regular folk. So, so, so God uses a people that hate them, a people who have oppressed them over the years to exalt them. God went into Mede and Persia and softened the king's heart that when he sent back Ezra, he didn't just send back Ezra and some exiles to make the best of what they could find. They came back with the finest gold that Babylon had taken from them. They came back with the finest timber with which to rebuild the temple. They came back with armed guards. The kings and princes sent them back with escorts. They, they went into the land because they knew it would be treacherous going into all of these enemy territories. God sent them with guards. So, so he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up my standard for the Gentiles. He said, I'm going to make it so that they will bring your sons back safely into Jerusalem. I will make sure that they will bring your daughters and that they will carry them on your shoulders. You know, God is able to do all things except fail. And, and, and he can use people that you would never believe he could use. You know, one of the things we, we sell God short, and I know we don't mean harm, and, and, and we should charge it to our heads and not our hearts. But, but, but God is such a great God. He can use your haters to be your elevators. And, and you need to know that. You need to believe that, that, that. That those persons with which you believe have your worst effort at heart or, 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 or care about you least or, or don't have good intentions toward you. God couldn't use those people to elevate you. You know, many of you, I know, have supervisors who you think don't like you. And maybe they don't. But God can use them to put you in a position of power. And we have to believe in the God that we serve. We can't just worship the God we serve on Sunday and not believe on Monday through Saturday. God does his best work when we are at our lowest place. And you got to believe that, that God does his best work when we're at our lowest place. Here are these exiles going back into a land that no longer has the dirt been rolled over. No crops have grown for 70 years. It's a barren land. No trees. No green growth. No vines. 
There's nothing because it was all burned down. The temple is gone. All you can see is some of the foundation bricks. And at that low moment in time is when God did his best work. When he lifted up Gentile king and said to him, I will use you to exalt my people. Remember, God has that power. God can use a donkey if he wants. The old song says, if you don't worship God, the rocks will cry out. So, so let us understand that no matter where we find ourselves on today, we serve a great God can just do all things. And, and, and not only is he able to do all things, he's willing to do them. But you've got to allow him. So, so many of us have decided to do it our way. And, and it's not worked for us. And, and many of us have given up and we just say, no, it's not even worth the effort. You know, can you imagine being an Israelite, going into Babylon, on year one as a 20-year-old, wondering if you're ever going to leave, if you're ever going to be able to return home, and five years passes, and 10 years passes, and 20 years passes, and 40 years passes, and finally, your will to come back home is gone because you have lived in captivity for 40 plus years and you can't see any way out. And sometimes that's how it is for us. You know, things have gone bad for us for so many years, we can't see any way out. But we serve a God who can and will allow us to prosper in this land and in any other land. And in the grand scheme of things, even if he doesn't, he's still a great God. Because he has made provision for you to live eternally in heaven. So if, if you don't know Christ in the pardon of your sins, you say yes to Christ. No matter what your situation on, is on earth, no matter where you live, no matter what your status is, no matter if you have no status, you have status in heaven. And that's where it all counts. You know, the... the the reversal of fortune. You know, there are so many people who are born poor. And now they're wealthy by the blessing of God, by, by the hand of God. Whether they give God the credit or not, by only the hand of God, he has reversed their fortune. But you need to remember something. You could be like Babylon. Maybe you are like Babylon. Maybe you believe yourself to be great. Maybe you believe that no one can touch you, that you are untouchable. Remember that we serve this great God who reverses fortunes. And while you're up today, there is no guarantee that you will always be up. We must learn to live in humility, recognizing that God will prosper us, but he'll prosper us in due time. That's not our time, that's his time. And those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings as, e as eagles. You know, they, they'll run. And one day, they'll walk. You know, and, and they won't faint. The, the, the critical thing is that they won't faint. You know, what happens to us in many times, many cases, is we lose our way. Then when we lose our way, we lose our will. But, but what happens is when we are refreshed by waiting on God and what that is able to do for us. I don't know waiting is hard. I recognize that one of the hardest things in all of life is to wait. But the message of the Bible has always been to wait on the Lord. That, 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 that one day, whatever your one day is, you know, our, our issue is, is we live in a microwave society. We want everything now, and, and I understand that. But when we learn to wait on the Lord, when we recognize that his empowerment will put us on another level, 
another level of spirituality, another level of maturity, another level uh, of righteousness. And one day, the heavens are going to open up for Christ coming for the rapture. The church is going to be raptured out because it's going to be a tribulation period. Seven years in the tribulation period. Then Christ will come back a second time and he will make his kingdom on the earth and the Jews will be restored. He says that, verse 23 says, kings will be your guardians and their princesses your nurses. They will bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick the dust of your feet. And you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. Clearly God is going to use your enemies to elevate you. There are going to be people, there are going to be people that don't like you that God will force to exalt you. He says in his word, and I believe his word is true, that, that, that one day all of the Gentile nations will pay homage to the Jewish nation and the God of the Jewish nation because one day the world will find out that it was him all the time. You know, right now the world exalts itself, but there will come a day, a reckoning day, when all men will find out that it was only by the grace of God. And those of us who hopefully wait, not just wait, but hopefully wait. See, when you are hopeful of something, it makes it easier to wait. But because you believe in your heart of hearts that it will come true. And if you believe that it will come true, it will make the waiting easier. Waiting is always hard, but it will make the waiting easier. And clearly, one day, we will see the glory of God with our own eyes, and we will be hopeful and not ashamed. You know, here, here's one of my last point, is that people who are ashamed, are typically restrained or unwilling to serve God because we fear ridicule and disrespect, disapproval from others. You know, the reason we don't go out and witness and proclaim Jesus is king, that he lives and that he's coming back is because we're unwilling to take the chance for God we believe that we need to play it safe. That, that, that the world is not ready for God. And, and, and that if you proclaim him, they will dishonor you. That's what, that's what you believe. That's what many of us believe. It's the reason we're not effective in ministry. is because we believe that if we say, if we fly the flag, the banner high, and we identify with Christ in front of the masses that they will make us pay, that they will dishonor us, that, that, that they will take from us those things which we desire. And maybe they will. And maybe they will. But which would you rather have in the long run? Fame of men, the fortune of the earth, or the glory of God? And that's your choice to make on today it is God will make you prosper. What does that mean? It means something different for all of us. But for sure, what we need to cling to in our hearts, what we need to hopefully wait for is that God would make, him, make us more like his son, Jesus Christ, day by day by day, by day, and not worry about how we affect that change. We just do what God has commanded us to do 
obey his word, and let the chips fall where they may, knowing that you serve a God who is in control of all things, a God who has predestined in the earth all things that will happen, who has near fulfillment that we have already seen and know to be true. We've seen this prophecy, and we've seen it come true. We know that God is true to his word. We, we, we know that he is true to his promises. And if he has brought these things to fruition in this near fulfillment, you can guarantee yourself that he will bring these things to fruition in the far fulfillment. And that's the hope that you should have in your God. Here are the three takeaways that my brother Glasby has written for us this week. There is a promised return in verses 18 through 19. The Lord asked his children to consider the things that were happening, for he would return them in great numbers, and their enemies would be far removed. A purpose for re reflection. Though he would not return his children in great numbers, such that the land would be, appear small, they would reflect on what was happening and why. I'm sorry, though he would return his children in great numbers, excuse me. And then finally, the prosperous result in verse 22 and 23 is the Lord informed his children they would be exalted by kings and queens of the world who would serve them and thus verifying the Lord is in control. We must remember to hopefully wait on the Lord and do as Isaiah has taught us. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk, not faint. This is the message of hopeful anticipation of God's promises. God bless you, and God keep you is my prayer.